The Garden of Eden was the first schoolroom. Nature was the first school book. Adam and Eve were the first students and God himself was the first teacher. And it is our hope that as we go through these lessons week by week, you are brought into a closer walk and an understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Sabbath School in Eden. My name is Kanye and I will take you through the last lesson of our first quarter of the year. Today we are on lesson 13. Before we start, shall we bow our heads in a short word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity you've given us to study your word. Lord, may you fill us with the Holy Spirit and move us and teach us what you want us to learn. I pray all this in your loving name. Amen. Um, as I've already mentioned, we are on lesson 13. It has been such a great lesson going through the Psalms um, right from the beginning of the lesson. And today we are at the very end. So our lesson title today is Wait on the Lord. Our memory text comes from Psalm 27, verse 14, and it says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Um, we have gone through a journey of experiences through the Psalms and the Psalmist and all the things they went through that constantly caused them to write um, songs of praises, songs of lament, songs of joy, back to their Lord Um through the joys of divine deliverance, forgiveness, salvation, through moments of grief and lament, and through the glorious promises of God's everlasting presence and anticipation of the unending universal worship of God. So now we are going to now be encouraged to wait on the Lord because when all is said and done, what we're looking forward to is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If there's a final word that should be drawn from the Psalms, it says here, it should be wait on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate bidding of one's time. Instead, waiting on the Lord is an act full of trust and faith, um, a trust and faith that's revealed in action. Waiting on the Lord transforms our gloomy evenings with the expectancy of a bright morning. And um, we are now going to go to Sunday, which is the first part of our lesson, and that's entitled The Call of Waiting. So Sunday talks about how one of the greatest stresses in life is the stress of waiting. It's never nice to wait for anything. Um, whether you're waiting for a job prospect or simply waiting in a queue, wherever we are, no matter where we live or who we are or whatever our situations are in life, at times we have to wait for things. From waiting in line in, in a store to hear a medical prognosis, we, um, we wait, and that's something we don't usually like doing. What then about waiting for God? The notion of waiting on the Lord is not only found in the Psalms, but abounds all throughout the Bible. The operative word in waiting for God is perseverance. Perseverance is our supreme commitment of refusing to succumb to fear and disappointments of what would happen if somehow God does not come through for us. As God's devoted children, we need to wait and know that he always comes through, no matter how long he takes. He says um, in the Bible that when the time is right, he will make it happen in the book of Isaiah. So I think that we need to learn to wait on the Lord. And waiting on the Lord is more than just hanging on. It's a deep longing for God that is compared to intense thirst in a dry and weary land. We found this in Psalm 63 verse 1. It said, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So uh, waiting on the Lord is a deep longing for God to be in his presence, to be filled with his Holy Spirit. The psalmist in the book of Psalms wait for many blessings from God, but his yearning to be brought closer to God surpasses any other desire and need in his life. And that's what we should have as we go through our daily lives, as we wait for God's second coming. That should be our biggest desire. It also says in the Bible, one of my favorite verses, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. So as we wait on God, we need to seek first um, his kingdom and his righteousness. While we wait for the ultimate salvation and reunion of God, even as the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, the Lord still abides with his people now through the Holy Spirit. So as we wait on God, we need to know that God has not left us. God is with us while we wait on him, while we wait for him. He's with us and he fills us with his Holy Spirit every single day, even though we might not see it at the time. Um, moving on to the second part of the lesson, we are moving on to Monday. And the title is Peace of a Winged Child. 
So winning of a child refers to um, when a mother wins, okay, <laughs> removes the baby from her suckling breast and now the baby moves on to eating solid foods. So it speaks here about um, the metaphor of a wind child is found in Psalm 131 verse 2. It says, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a wind child with a smother, like a wind child is my soul within me. This is a powerful image of one who finds calmness and who is quieted in the embrace of God. It points to the loving relationship that a child has with their mother through this vulnerable time. Um, through winning us from substantial ambitions, so God wins us off ourselves and leads us in the path that he wants us to go. So he wins us from insubstantial ambitions and pride and our selfishness and introduces us to the nourishment of solid food, which is to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. Also, that childlike trust that's depicted in Psalm 131 is mature faith that has been tried and tested by the hardships of life and has found God to be faithful and true to his word. So through all the difficulties we go through, through all the waiting and the tribulations, we are matured in faith. And that is God's way of weaning us from our selfish desires, our selfish needs, our sinful ways into a path that he desires that we walk on, into an image and a character that is reflective of his own. Um, we are now going to move on to Tuesday, which is um, the third part of our lesson. This one is entitled Bringing in the Sheaves. So when we talk about bringing in the sheaves, this is something that happens at the end of a harvest season. This is something that farmers will look forward to. It says here that the end of the harvest season was the time when the ancient Hebrew pilgrimages brought the fruits of the season to God's temple in Jerusalem. The harvest motive provided potential, a potent spiritual lesson to the people at that time. Just as the labor of sowing and caring for the fields and the orchards and the vineyards is rewarded with the joy of a plentiful harvest. So the present trials of God's people will be crowned with the joy of salvation at the end of time. So whatever it is that we go through on a daily basis through all our lives, the hardships, the sorrows, the way in which we deal with them is what will make it joyous in the end. So as we go through all the things that we go through, we need to bear in mind that there is a reward at the end of all of it. One day Jesus will come, everything as we know it will change. All the hardships will end. There'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. So we look forward to a plentiful harvest at the end of our difficult season. And this is one of the reasons why we need to wait on the Lord. At this point, we're going to take a short break, um, but we will be right back. Please remember to like, comment, share our page, so subscribe to our channel um, so that we may reach people far and wide with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. See you after the break. Thank you for being part of our Sabbath School community. We invite you to continue watching and exploring our study together. To access more of our enriching lessons and dive deeper into the teachings, simply download the adult Sabbath School lessons at www.ssnet.org. Sharing this link can make a difference and potentially save a life. Join us in this journey of spiritual growth and discovery. Thank you for being part of our Sabbath School family. Welcome back to Sabbath School in Eden and thank you for staying with us. We are moving on to the next part of our lesson. This is entitled Waiting in God's Sabbath Rest. So the Sabbath as we know it is God's agreement with his people. That's God's um, one of the signs of the Lord's eternal covenant with his people. So um, it is not surprising to find thoughts about consecration in a psalm that is dedicated to the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the sign that the Lord sanctifies his people. So um, it says here that the, the, that's the Sabbath rest is essential to God's people because it empowers them to wait trustingly upon the Lord to fulfill all his covenantal promises. So if the Sabbath is a covenant between us and God, and we know of so many promises. A covenant is an agreement. We know of so many promises that God makes to us throughout the Bible. When we pray, we repeat these promises to him and ask him to grant us our needs and desires. So if the Sabbath is a covenant that has been kept from the beginning of time, surely we can rest assured that God will keep the rest of his covenantal promises, including the fact 
that one day um, Jesus Christ will come back and get us. So we need to wait on the Lord with the mind that God is faithful to his promises. Um, then the last part of our, of our lesson is entitled, Joy Comes in the Morning. In the Psalms, there's a lot of verses that depict mourning as the end of a difficult era. Mourning is typically the time when God's redemption is anticipated. Mourning reveals God's favor, which ends the long night of despair and trouble. In Psalm 143, God's deliverance will reverse the present darkness of death into the light of a new morning and from being in the pit into residing in the land of uprightness. Um, as the morning star announces the birth of a new day, so faith heralds the new reality of eternal life in God's children. Jesus is called the bright and morning star in whom we eagerly await to establish his kingdom in which there will be no more night, no more death, no more evil. In the end, more than anything else, this is what we are waiting for when we talk about waiting on the Lord. And surely the wait is worth it. So someday Jesus will come back and get us and it will be the end of a very long night of despair, of darkness, of pain, of sickness, of death, the loss of our loved ones. But one day we have something to look forward to, something to hold on to, something that will make us yearn for the Lord. We wait for him because we trust that someday, as he has promised, he will keep his promise and he will come, get to get, come back to get those that are faithful to him. And then when I, before we close, there's a part here that's written by one of the authors that I like. It says here that when waiting strikes us as burdensome, uncertain and lonely, we should remember the disciples on the day of Jesus' ascension to heaven. Jesus was taken to heaven before their very eyes and they watched him go. And Jesus said, they should wait for him because he will be back for them. Can you imagine waiting for Jesus for an unknown period of time? He will be back, but one day, someday, they didn't know when. So it says here that who has ever experienced a more intense yearning to receive God's blessing than the disciples on that day? Surely they yearned, Lord, just take us with you now. Yet they were instructed to wait for the promise of the Father and for Jesus' return. So we have received that same promise today. This is what gets us through all our trials and tribulations. When we lose loved ones, when we lose jobs, when we go through stresses, we know that Jesus is coming back and we have been um, encouraged to wait on Jesus. And as we wait on Jesus, I think that my takeaway from this general lesson from the beginning of um, the quarter, we've learned about the Psalms, we've learned about the relationships that the, the Psalm is cultivated with God. I think that we need to learn to create that same relationship with God. We need to go to Him with our happiness, go to Him with our praise, go to Him with our sadness, go to Him with our lament and our grief and our sorrows and our anger. Every single thing we go through, we need to take it to the Lord as to a friend, because God already knows what's in our hearts anyway. So we need to give him that space to be in our space and have a relationship with him that will make it easier for us to grow our faith, to mature our faith as we wait on the Lord to come and get us one day. Ask that we carry on watching these lessons, carry on studying the word. We're going to start a new course next week. I pray that we may invite our friends and our families to join us in the study of God's word as we encourage one another and uh, um, empower each other to wait on the Lord. We will see you next week at the beginning of a brand new quarter. May you be blessed. Remember to like, comment, share, subscribe, interact with us on our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. See you next week.